What's up Westside? My name's Gianna and I'm so glad that you decided to log on here today and watch with us. Maybe it's your first time here or maybe you haven't clicked our connect link down below. If that is the case, then I need you to click that link. It's gonna say new. It's gonna bring you to a page that just lets you fill out all the information about you so we can get to know you, follow up with you, and of course, gift you a free Westside mug. Stay tuned for some announcements and the rest of the service. We hope you enjoy and we're so glad that you're here. I, I, uh, I, th I think I introduced myself earlier, but if I didn't get a chance to, my name is Brooks and uh, so grateful that, uh, that my wife and I have been able to be here uh, leading Westside for the past eight or so years. And um, it's uh, just a huge honor uh, to call to call ourselves uh, one of you, among you. So a uh, couple things going on in the life of our church. Don't want you to miss out on first, if you're new, if you're visiting, or even if you've been here just a few times. Um, listen, you are, we're so glad you're here. Uh, we know it takes a lot of courage to come to someplace new. So uh, we've got these yellow pieces of paper scattered around the room. They say, welcome, fill that out if you dare, all right? And you can take it to the, uh, to the Connect area out there. And we've got a gift for you. It's a West Side mug. That's just our thank you to say thank you for coming and taking a risk on coming to West Side. Also, listen, it's our way to just at least get an email address so that we can follow up with you, see if there's anything that we can do to help uh, with, with anything that you might need. So it's just our way to be able to have a, a, a contact point. So glad you're here. And there's all sorts of things happening are also scattered around. There are these little white pieces of paper with a list of some of the things that are going on this month. And feel free to grab that, take that home, slip it into a journal or slip it into, you know, whatever so you can have that so you know what's going on. A couple things going on is you came on chilly night, so maybe you didn't know that, but tonight is chilly night. So we thought we'd kick off the year with uh, after service. Just go on out there and we've got chili for everybody. We just want people to just hang out, chat, talk. We've got, um, we're also gonna have, uh, did you see the big screen that we put out there? It's huge, go big or go home is what we decided to do with the screen. So um, there's gonna be uh, like an old school uh, cartoon playing out there for the kids and for the adults. So um, we just, we want you to be able to stick around. We know that building community can be challenging. We just know it can. And so that's why we want to create spaces for us to be able to meet each other, get to know. Can I challenge you on something? Don't just talk to the people you know. That's really easy to do. Um, I, I can be guilty of that too. So I just want to challenge you, push you to introduce yourself to somebody else, sit down with maybe a few people you never met before and just see where the conversation leads you. So uh, that is why we're doing that tonight. Um, look at those sheets of paper. I want you to know that there's, we're going to launch some new community groups in February. So you'll be hear, hearing more about those as they get closer. And um, yeah, that's all the stuff going on. Um, I'll mention a few more things in a second, but uh, thank you. Uh, for always being generous. We're, as we follow Jesus, we know that he's pushing us to be more generous, and there's all sorts of ways that you are finding ways to be generous. Um, we hope that one of those ways that you're generous is to your church, and so thank you for the ways that you give, and there's all sorts of ways to give, and we try to make it really easy to, and efficient to give online or to give in person, or there's a text to give option. You can text the word give to that number up there, and it's super easy to do. There's multiple ways to do it, and then a lot of people do like recurring giving, so that it's just a part of their rhythm. Um, anyways, there's, there's all sorts of ways to do it. I just, I just want to let you know that we're so, so grateful and humbled by what's given because then we're able to take that and to be strategic and think about what we get to do as a church together, um, how we get to budget and plan for how to reach our city. It's really, really important. So thank you so, so, so much. Um, awesome. Well, uh, next week, you do not want to miss, we're going to start a new sermon series. And this is kind of like our tradition at Westside. We always start off the year with a, with a sermon series Sometimes it's short, sometimes it's long, but we figure if we're going to spend a lot of time in the Bible, that we should start off the year by just reminding ourselves why the Bible is important and how to read the Bible. And so next week we're going to start a new sermon series called How to Misunderstand the Bible because the Bible is easily misunderstood. And unfortunately, we come to the Bible with all sorts of presuppositions and all sorts of, we, we come to it with our own lenses and then sometimes we miss the forest for the trees. And unfortunately, many people have done bad Bad readings of the scripture and have caused many people to say, man, if that's what the Bible's about and if that's what Christianity is about, then I don't want to have any part of it. And I just don't want us to be those kind of Christians. I want us to read the Bible responsibly and well. And so we're just going to talk. We're going to spend a couple weeks and talk about um, how to understand the Bible, how to not misunderstand the Bible. That starts next week. So you do not 
want to miss. A part of that, I gotta give a mention, this is, sorry, I'm still, I feel like, I said I was done with announcements, but I'm actually not, I tricked you. I'm, I'm continuing on with announcements. Part of reading the scriptures is just coming to, um, uh, is just being students of the Bible. And I've been on a journey this last year on, on rethinking what I believe about what the Bible says about, the, about women in ministry, in the church, and at home. I don't know what you grew up being taught or, or being taught that the Bible does teach about this, but um, I, I've just been on a journey of just doing just deep study and thinking and reading. And actually, we're, our denomination, our family of churches, we're a four-square church. Maybe you didn't know that, but we're a part of a, of a denomination, a movement of churches that was started by a woman, Amy Simple McPherson, in 1920. Uh, she was a prolific evangelist, and um, at the core of our denomination is the belief that women should be empowered to be able to lead churches and to preach and to teach and have authority in those areas. But like me and like you, you come up to some verses, especially in the New Testament and Corinthians and Timothy, and you're, it's like, whoa, what, what am I supposed to do with this? Paul is saying some things that, how, do you, how, do, how does it all jive together? Listen, I just, I want to do a two-night lecture series and just dive deep into, into that topic. And I just want to share with you some conclusions that I've come to recently and just some, some, the journey that I've been on. And we're just going to look at a lot of scripture together. That's going to be on two Tuesday nights in January. So, um, but it's designed to be experienced together. So you don't want to just come to one. You're going to like miss out on a ton. So um, I want you to commit to both. And if you can come to those on a Tuesday night, so there's going to be at the loft on Tuesday evenings, then sign up. Okay. And um, you can sign up online and actually we didn't have a sign-up sheet out there, but we probably should have a sign-up sheet out there. Um, anyways, if you want to come, just let us know that you want to come just so we can know that, uh, that you're planning on it so we can prepare for you. Awesome. Okay, I promise. I'm done. Um, it's the new year, and that means we're all thinking about second chances. We're all thinking about our New Year's resolutions, right? Um, some of you were tired of the resolution thing because we've tried and failed so many times that it's like, ah, forget it. You know, like I'm just not even going to do it. For some of us, though, we, this is a time of year where we actually do make some resolutions that carry us through the year. Some of us are better at this than others. But um, it is the perfect time of year for us to just stop and, and think about what, you know, we assess what happened this last year. And it's a good time for us to think about who we want to be and what we want to do and how we want God to shape us and form us in the year to come. And so this passage of scripture that I'm going to read to you, is, it's a story about second chances. It's a story about taking God who is in, who perhaps in the periphery, on the edges, and bringing him into the center. It's a story about about second chances and learning from those first chances so that we don't make some of those same mistakes, so that we don't come to the same conclusions sometimes that as we did those first chances, and that moves us into some, some better second chances. That's what this story is all about. It comes from the Old Testament. It comes from the life of David. Um, and I would love to give just tons more context to the life of David, but um, God has, just for whatever reason, he's decided to reveal his, himself to the nations through this one family, this one big tribe of people, the Israelites. And one of the, the, the most famous king that came out of, of Israel was King David. And King's David, King David's life was, was, you know, there was ups and there were some downs. And one of the things that we get from this story is that God paints some really beautiful pictures with some really crooked lines. It's actually really, really good news for us. But uh, from this point, uh, from this story that I want to read from, from, uh, from this passage in 2 Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel, or is it 1 Samuel? It's 2 Samuel. Um, what's happening is there's this Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant is needing to get moved. And so you, you're familiar with the Ark of the Covenant because you probably watched Raiders of the Lost Ark. That was my first introduction to the Ark of the Covenant. And apparently when you get close to the Ark of the Covenant, your face melts off, all right? That's what I learned by, that's what I knew about the Ark of the Covenant growing up. Um, but, uh, but we're going to read a little bit in this story, and it's a beautiful story, perfect for the new year. It's been good for my heart, I've been, as I've just been chewing on it. I hope it's, it's, I hope it's good for yours tonight. I'll read it. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. I'm going to read it, and then we'll just, kind of, we'll just kind of go through it. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala to Ju or in Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned 
uh, between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab. If you're having a baby soon and you're thinking about baby names, I want you to consider Abinadab. It just is fun to say. Abinadab, which was on the, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. It's a, it's a big party going on. Um, they're bringing the, the Ark of the Covenant from where it was to Jerusalem. Here's what happens. When they came to the threshing floor of Nekon, Uzzah reached out and took hold, of the, uh, ho- took hold of the Ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. And therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. I'm like, why is he reading this in the new year? What, what is going on? Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah, which, which translates to this is where God's anger lashed out at, at Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed him in his entire household. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David, that was Jerusalem, with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all of his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. Okay. Okay. Um, so what is the story about and what is going on? Because this is a story of second chances. This is a story about bringing God from the periphery to the center. So some context is this. At this point, the Ark of the Covenant isn't in Jerusalem. It's not in the main city. It's, it's uh, K- King, uh, King Saul before David had moved the, the Ark of the Covenant from this place to that place. And, and he had left it previously at the house of of, um, how, what was his name again? Abinadab, right? Now I've left like some, some Tupperware at somebody's house before, you know, like I've left maybe a phone charger at somebody's house. Um, the Ark of the Covenant got left at Abinadab's house and it had been there for a long time. But David's the new king now. And so David is in this moment where he says, I want to bring, I want to bring the Ark back into the city. I want to bring it from the periphery. I want to, I want to bring it into the central part. Uh, I want to bring it into the, back into the central part of our life here and the central part of, of our country and the central part of, of, of God's people. So what's the ark? Well, it's, it's, this, it's, a, it's actually a, sim, a simply made box um, of acacia wood. It's covered in gold. It's got these two cherubim, which are like angels on top. And God wanted them to, to build it in a specific way. It's supposed to be constructed specifically to, to, to certain specifications. And it was supposed to be carried in a specific way. This is the plot twist that comes in a little bit later as to what went wrong. Like what, what's going on here? And what happened with Uzzah? And what, why did that all happen? Because God wanted it to be carried in a specific way. We'll get back to that in a second. But the ark was... was it was this, like, it was like the resting place of God's presence. One of the, one of the ways to describe the ark is, it, one of the ways it's described in the Bible is that it was his footstool. And if you think about a king who's sitting on a throne, the king sits on a throne and, uh, and the king would have a, a footstool and that's where the king's like feet would rest. And it's like God is like, it's like he's up in heaven, but the place where his feet rested, like his, his footstool was, was the ark. It's, it's, just, it's just kind of poetic to say that it was like this one special place where God's presence was, was most powerfully experienced. And it was, and it was, uh, it was the, and the Israelites would take this ark everywhere that they went. And it was this beautiful picture of like, God has not left them. It's a constant reminder of his presence with them. And um, there was a couple things in the ark. There was the 10 commandments, the actual tablets of the 10 commandments. Um, there was 
some, a, a jar of manna from when the Israelites were traveling through uh, the desert and God provided for them. And then there was Aaron's rod that was, that was, that was budded. And that, you, can read, you, can, you can read about that um, on your own. But all these things are supposed to be reminders of God's provision. It's not just, the, the ark was not just a place of his presence, but it was a reminder of his provision. It was like, it was like God wanted them at, at all times to remember that when they've got the ark and they're, they're, the ark is with them, that they're supposed to be reminded that God's presence is with them, that he hasn't left them, that he has provided for them over and over and over again. Um, and it's supposed to point to all that. This is what uh, Eugene Peterson says. I think he's right. He says this. He says, the ark did not have magical properties, nor did the Hebrews suppose that it did. The Hebrews were not a superstitious people. They didn't think that the ark made them lucky. They didn't suppose the ark was a source of power they could plug into. The Hebrews were rather a historical people. They believed God worked in their lives, that God did things. He was not a blurred glow of sentiment. God was not an abstract concept. God was not a remote legislator passing laws on gravity and adultery. God was not a bearded judge, austere and and exacting. God was personal in history, creating, directing, saving, blessing. God entered the affairs of men and women, and when he did, he judged and saved and called to account and blessed. Most of all, he loved. He entered into covenants with his people, giving them the dignity of sharing his work, living by faith and in love. This is like, it's a special thing that God has created, his presence and his reminder of his provision. And David decides that he wants to bring it back into the center of Israel. And this is what the story is about, is what do you do when you realize that God hasn't been in the center? What do you do when you realize that God has been in the periphery? He's been out of town. He's been, he's been out on the edge. But, but what do you do when you realize that he hasn't been in the center? What do you do? What do you do? This is what this story is about. And it's supposed to just it's supposed to push us a little bit. It's, what do you do when you have the realization that God isn't centrally factoring into your marriage? What do you do when you, when you realize that God hasn't been factoring centrally into your singleness? What do we do when we, when we just come to the realization that God hasn't factored into our career? God, that God isn't at the center of my decisions. That God isn't at the center of my time outside of work. What do you do when you're confronted with just when you just realize that, wow, God is not at the center in this part of my parenting. God isn't at the center of this part of my life. He's been on the fringe. He's been on the edges. He's been on the periphery. That's what this story is about. What do you do? This is where David is. He realizes that God's presence has been pushed out to the edge and he wants to bring it back into the prominence and the prestige that, that, that it needs to be, that it used to be. And so he's going to bring it back into the center. Um, I don't know about you, but, um, and so what does he do? Well, he just, he goes and gets the ark. That's what he does. What do you do when you realize that God isn't at the center? Well, you, we, we, in a way, it's a little bit simple. Or initially, it's very simple. You, you, you go and get him. You say, God, I want you to be in the center. This is what David did. He, go, he goes and he gets the ark. Um, I, in college, I graduated from the University of Oregon with a fine art degree. And I started throwing pots on the pottery wheel when I was in high school. And this is, this is a video of me actually throwing a pot for a video um, a, a couple years ago for our church. And so um, I was throwing pottery all through high school. And then in college, I was dabbling in all sorts of different stuff. I ended up just kind of making that be my focus for college. I know not a smart financial move, all right? Not a lot of money in selling pots. Um, but I didn't do it for that. I did it because I did it because I knew it was just something that I wanted to, to just dig down in and, 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 and really master. Here's one of the things about pottery when you, it's on the wheel is you get that raw clay and you put it on the center of the wheel. One of the most important things that you have to do at the beginning is you have to center the clay. Some of you have taken a class and you know that centering the clay is so important. If you don't center the clay, no matter what else you do down the line, it's gonna be wobbly, it's gonna be off, you're, you're, you're not gonna produce something that, um, that you're gonna to wanna to keep. So centering is key, and centering is a hard discipline to master. It takes, you gotta, you gotta, you, you gotta like sit down, like get real nice and strong, and you gotta get that clay, and you gotta pull it, and you gotta harangue it, and you gotta push it. And you got to give it, apply pressure, and you got to get to it, get it 
to a place where the wheel is spinning and it doesn't even look like it's moving anymore because it's just directly in the center. Centering is so, so important when it comes to pottery. And centering is exactly what David is doing in this passage. This is a story about David saying, Lord, I want you to be at the center of the city. I want you to be at the center of our life as a people because David knows that if God isn't at the center, then things are going to get wobbly. That things are just that things aren't going to work out like he thinks it's going to work out. And the thing that Israel was guilty of over and over again, and I don't know if you can relate to this. Um, I know you can um, because I can. Is that they were guilty over and over again of forgetting, forgetting. They just kept on forgetting. God would rescue them. And then a couple minutes later, it seems, they would just forget. They would forget about his provision. They'd forget that, that, he, that he loved them and that he rescued them. And so they were just constantly just forgetting. Constantly, they'd be rescued and they'd say, thank you, God, we're never going to do that again. And then just minutes later, they're off doing that again. And I don't know if you can relate to that, because, except I know that you can. Because I can too. Because this is where we live. I so often just forget that God is there and that his presence has been promised and that he loves me and that, and that he's brought me this far and that he's never going to leave me and that it's all about what he's done for me, not what I can do for him. And there's just like this freeing thing there. And I, sometimes I just forget it and I just get busy. I get distracted. I just, I just go look for other things that I think are going to fulfill me. And I go, go you know, or, or I get dive into just performance mode where I think that God needs me to do this, 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 and this. And if I don't, then he doesn't love me anymore. We just fall off the wagon in all sorts of different ways. And David knows that in order for things to stay centered and secure, in order for them to not forget that they need to have the ark there so that they can look at it and they could say, God is with us. He's never left us. And because they easily forget and because you and I easily forget, sometimes, sometimes something's got to happen that just jolts us out of our, of our uh, just jolts us a little bit. It just, it's got to shake us up so that we can have eyes to see again how important it is to bring God into the center. And that's exactly what happens in this story because somebody dies. <laughs> All right, so let's get to that part because that part is such a strange, what went wrong? What went wrong? There, it seems like everybody's heart is in the right place. They're bringing the ark to Jerusalem. So you think like everything seems fine. And, and then it's like, man, what's the deal with Uzzah? Like it's God, you know, a lot of times people look at this passage and say, God isn't a good God. I mean, Uzzah's just trying to help. I mean, the guy's just like reaching out because he doesn't want the ark to fall over. And uh, he touches the ark. He's not supposed to touch the ark. And he's, he's struck dead. Like, this doesn't seem like a God of patience, you know, or kindness. Like, what is the deal that's going on? Now, there's a couple of clues in the text. They're actually really, really helpful. And if you, and if you don't know what they are, then they're easily missed. Um, there's a clue. It's in verse 3. It tells us that they put, the, they put the ark on a new cart. It says it twice in verse 3. That they put the ark on a new cart. We know that it's pulled by some oxen because the oxen stumble, and that's why the ark is, is, uh, is about to topple over. Um, Uzzah grabs it to steady it, and, you know, it's like, what's the deal? The two things that I see going on here that is just important for us to understand about what went wrong in this first try of getting the ark back into the center. Efficiency and flippancy. Efficiency and flippancy. All right, here's the first one, efficiency. Um, the ark, here's the thing about the ark. The ark was designed to be movable, okay? I mean, it was supposed to move around with the Israelites, except God had told them that he wanted, their, he wanted it to be moved in a specific way. It wasn't supposed to be pulled by a cart. It wasn't supposed to be pulled by an ox. It wasn't supposed to be like, you know, like, you know, get a bunch of Arnold Schwarzenegger types, you know, or some strong ladies in there and just like carry the ark on their shoulders. It wasn't supposed to be moved that way. It was supposed to be moved in a much more slow but personal way. It was supposed to be carried by priests on poles. There were, there were holes for the poles to get put into. The poles would get to put on there, and then the, the priests would carry the poles and not touch the ark. Priests with poles. That's how God wanted the ark to be carried. And we might look at that and say, like, oh, and what, why? Like, you know, what, why does it need to be that way? And we don't really know necessarily. I think it has to do with God is just communicating that his presence is a personal presence. Like he wants this to be like, this is a personal thing. It's slower to move the ark with priests on poles, but it's more personal. It's going to take some more time, but this is how God wanted the ark to be carried. And they knew that. 
But here's what happens is they're like, and, and I can relate. And I know you can relate too, because they were like, hey, you know what? God, we have some new technology now. It's called the wheel, right? We've got some oxen and we've got a cart. I don't know if you've heard about this, God. It's actually really slick. There's an oxen and it's really strong and we don't actually have to carry the ark on poles. It digs into your shoulders. It's not, good. It's not fun, God. So we put the ark on a cart. We have a hack for this now, God. Like we have a quicker way. This is more efficient. This is just better. You know, this is just a, I, I know you wanted it with priests and poles, but look, our way is so much better. It's so much more efficient and we're gonna get there so much more quickly. And so you think that, you know, so they're, they're like innovating here, you know, they're like, oh, God doesn't mind, you know, like, and this way is more efficient and this is just better. So, you know, God's fine with it. And so they just kind of go with it. They go with it. And, uh, you know, it's almost as if they're saying it's, and I think one of the things we're supposed to take away from this is it's like this thing where we say, say, God, hey, like we want your presence, but we just don't want to do it your way. Like we want your blessing, but we don't, but we'd rather just do it our way because we have some better ways than your ways, God. And so, hey, can we just still kind of have the blessing in your presence, but just not have to obey? Like we just, can we just have a system where that works? By the way, little side note, this is one of the things that I took away too. Um, notice that when they're carrying it, and they know they're carrying it not to how God wanted them to carry it. Notice that David and, and all of Israel, they've, they've got a party going on. It's like, you know, like there's like a party and there's, and they're just dancing and they're, cause they're like, hey, we're bringing the, the ark back to Jerusalem. Um, and, you know, judging by the importance of the occasion and all the instruments, I mean, this is quite the production. The atmosphere is joyful, exciting, engaging. The problem was that none of it was pleasing the Lord. And as a side note, what I took from that is it's just, I think we often in the, our modern day, the way that we do church, I think a lot of times we're often tempted to judge a worship experience by how it makes us feel. But when we realize that worship is about pleasing God and not about how it makes us feel, um, it, uh, let me put it this way. Sometimes we judge like worship experiences by like how awesome the drums got played. Todd, you did great tonight, by the way, wherever you are. Um, you know, like how it all sounds like, how did it make me feel? How did it make me feel? And what I get from this passage is everyone's feeling really, really great about their awesome worship and God is not digging it. And we just have to be so careful that we don't judge worship by how it makes us feel. <laughs> Because sometimes worship can feel really good, but if we're not choosing to obey God and worship him in the ways that he wants us to worship, then we run the danger of, of, of what happens in, with the, promi, the prophet Amos. In the, in the book of Amos, God says, hey, all of your songs that you're singing, I hate them. I can't stand your songs. You're singing these songs to me, but you oppress the poor. You're singing these songs to me, but you're, you're oppressing the weak. Because I don't want to hear your songs any more. So we just have to be so careful that sometimes we're not just caught up. And is it good for like the worship to sound good and like us to like feel good? Like, sure, I love that. I love that as much as anybody else does. But we just have to be careful that we don't measure worship by how it makes us feel. We have to measure worship by how pleased is God with the kind of worship that we're giving him. And that has less to do with instruments and it has, to more, has more to do with what you do on Monday, with what you do when you leave here. That's worship. Sorry, side note. Moving on. Here's what happens is Eugene Peterson says this about Uzzah. I think he's right. He says, a well-designed ox cart is undeniably more efficient for moving the ark about than plotting Levites. But it is also impersonal. The replacement of consecrated people by an efficient machine. Uzzah is, listen to this. Uzzah is the patron saint of those who uncritically embrace technology without regard to the nature of the holy. Whoa. Now, God's not, he's not saying God's against technology. It's just, it's just they've got this new, like, new technology that just makes the, the, the movement of the ark so much more efficient. But they didn't stop to think, is this right? They didn't stop to think, like, what is this, what is this saying? What is this what is this doing? Does this, does this, does me, us embracing this sort of way of, of, of moving the ark, does this, is this leaning into what God says is right and true and good for what he wants? Or is it, is it just better for us? Is it just make me feel good? And God isn't against technology, but I think it's important that we have to stop 
every once in a while, where's my, oh, I didn't bring my phone up here. I was going to pull out my phone, but just imagine I have my phone. Why don't you pull out your phone? Anybody, somebody pull out your phone. Hold it up. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, phone. These are, those are amazing things, aren't they? They are so amazing. And they're so efficient. Like, there's so many things that it can do. I mean, like, think about when we didn't, can anybody remember when we didn't have those things? Like, wow, what did we do? I don't know, we just sat around and stared at the wall, I guess, or I don't know what we did. But man, those phones are incredible, aren't they? Is God against the phones? No, but, but we have to stop sometimes. And we have to say, is this, is what I'm doing with this? And maybe it's not a phone, maybe it's your TV. Maybe it's not your TV, maybe it's a video game system. If it's not a video game system, I don't know what it is for you. But you have to stop and say, is this forming me in the way of Jesus? Or is this pushing me away from being formed in the way of Jesus? That's a deep question. It's an important question that they didn't stop to ask. And so that's why it goes horribly wrong. Then it's not just efficiency, but it's also flippancy. Fl- flippancy. So, I mean, I know it seems like Uzzah, he reaches out. It seems like a like a, like a noble thing to do, but he knows, I and mean, they all know they're not supposed to touch the ark. They know that they're carrying it, not in the way that God wants them to. And, and so he just kind of like, just, you know, just, just reach out and, and grab the ark. And, and there's consequences to that. And one of the other places in the New Testament that we have something similar to this is in the, the church in Corinth. Apparently they were taking communion in, um, in some really flippant ways. Some people were getting drunk off the wine. Some people were stealing the bread. And so some people couldn't get the bread. And there was just like backbiting and there was anger and there was like unforgiveness, but they're still you know, going to take the Lord's Supper together. And Paul says this crazy thing that theologians are still trying to figure out. What exactly does he mean where he says that some, some of the people were got, were got sick and even died because they were taking communion in an unworthy manner? <gasps> What does that mean? I don't even quite know what it means. I, well, I think I know what it means. I think it, I think it means that, that there's something about sometimes the way that we approach God, and, and it, sometimes it's like a, in a flippant sort of a way, in like a Jesus is my buddy pal sort of a way. Jesus is my friend who, you know, isn't going to tell me the truth, well, just is going to be fine with whatever I want to do. Like in, in those sort of ways that sometimes we just, sometimes we miss out on the holy Sometimes we miss out on things, or sometimes it actually might hurt us because we're just missing out on, we're not asking those questions of, of God, where, 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 where can I like, encounter your, your holiness? And so Uzzah was a little bit flippant. I, it, this happened with, with me recently. I was thinking back to when I was in college, I was driving over to Bend in my car, and I was a single guy at the time. I was by myself, and I was driving my sweet silver Chevrolet Celebrity, and uh, it was just an awesome car. But, you know, I think I had just watched Fast and Furious or something because I was, it was like icy roads, the snow was coming down. And I'm just a single dude by myself in this car that I don't really care about. So, you know, I'm like, I'm like trying to drift around the corners, you know. It's like, hey, I'm going to bend like up over the pass, but it's okay. Like, whoosh, you know. And I think back on that and I'm like, what was I thinking, you know? At one point, at one point, this guy in front of me stopped and I put on the brakes and I sort of slid and just, we went and then, you know, I kind of, it wasn't a bad crash, but I crashed into the back of him and it was this whole big deal. So juxtapose that with my driving that I did a couple days ago when I drove my family after Christmas up to central Washington where I was meeting a lot of the rest of my family. So think about this. The roads were horrible. It was, the, the kids had to pee every five seconds. And so we were, we were in the car for like nine hours and these were like 30, 30 miles an hour, just treacherous driving conditions. And listen, here I am. I've got the most precious things in the world to me in the car. 10 and 2, white knuckle, focused, don't talk to me. You know, like, I am focused. I am going to keep us alive, you know? <laughs> because sometimes, sometimes we just need to be, we need to sober up a little bit. And we need, to, we need to, like, remember that what we're doing here is sacred and holy and beautiful and rich and deep. And I think one of the things that happens in this story is they needed, to, they, needed to, they needed to know that what they were doing with the ark was they were disobeying the Lord and they needed a moment where they just needed a little bit of, little bit of sobering up. They needed a moment where they were like, okay, we, we, kind of, we, kind of, we kind of messed up on this one. 
We didn't, we didn't treat God's presence with the, with the respect and, the, 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 and the, 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 the depth and the holiness that it, that it, that it deserves and that it needed. And, and so they just needed to pause. And so notice what happens in the story. David leaves the ark at, for three months at some other guy's house. He's like, I don't know what to do with this thing. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on. And he has to reassess. But you notice what he does. Check this out. This is the second chance. This is the second chance. He wants to, he's got the right attitude. He's got the right heart. He wants to bring God's presence back into Jerusalem, right? But, but the first time he, they didn't do it in the way that they were supposed to do it. And so he's learned now. And so second time, three months later, he realizes, man, the, the ark is blessing this family. Like God wants to bless, like his presence is a blessing. And so he says, okay, now it's time to bring it back into the city of Jerusalem. And do you know what he does in verse 13? Uh, I think I have it on the screen. In verse 13, it says, when those, uh, when those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. You just notice these little clues in the text. What are they doing now? Now that they're walking in Jerusalem? Oh, they're carrying it on some poles, priests with poles. And it took, I guarantee you, it was so much less efficient. It took so much longer. But now they're doing it right. Now they're bringing God's presence into the city, back at the center not trying to get your way through your way, but trusting God enough to bring him into the center. David returned to the first things that he knew. He slowed down, he worshiped, he sacrificed, he obeyed. Band, can you guys come back up? I just want us to close. Um, and as we do, here's the question that I just want to leave with you, for you to ponder, for you to think about as we sing this last song, for you to ponder as we take communion together. In the, in the beginning of this new year, right? It's a new year. That means there's, there's, new, there's, there's second chances, everyone. And I know you've heard this sermon before. Oh, God gives second chances and third chances. But listen, I, I, just, I want you to come face to face with the reality that you might have messed up a ton last year. You might have messed up a ton yesterday. God knows. You might have had all the best intentions last year to bring God into the center of your marriage, and you failed. You might have tried everything, you might have done, you might have had some really great ideas about how you were going to bring God into the center of your parenting last year, and it fizzled, perhaps. That you, that you as a single person, you're like, this year I'm going to date different. This year I'm not, I'm going to just, I'm going to do it God's way. I'm going to bring him into the center of everything. And you, you started with the best intentions, and then it just, it didn't work out. You, or you, you got sidetracked, you got distracted, you, you lost sight of what you were planning on doing, and who knows where that led you. I, I, I don't know what last year was like for you. I don't know what last week was like for you. But this story is a story of second chances. David didn't do it right the first time, but he had a chance to do it right the second time. And he did. He wanted to bring God into the center. And so he decided that second time he's going to do it God's way. And listen, that opportunity is in front of every single one of you this evening. In front of me this evening. You just, we, get, we all get second chances this year. Do you have the courage to bring God into the center of your finances this year? You can. It's your chance. Do you want to bring God into the center of your marriage this year? You can. Do you want to bring God into the center of your decision making this year? Do you want to bring God into the center of your career this year? Yes. Yes. I, I, I hope you do. I want you to. And if you haven't done it well in the past, it's gonna be your tendency to say, why even try? I'm just gonna give up. I'm not even gonna try. It just never seems to work. Stop, stop. This is a story of second chances. All you have to do is just do what David did. You just gotta go get the ark. You know what it takes? It takes intentionality and it takes a plan. It takes intentionality and it takes a plan. You just have to be intentional. You just have to say, I wanna bring God into the center. And then you're gonna to have to like, you're gonna to have to sit down with your spouse and say, okay, what's our plan for making God be at the center of how we parent this year? What's our plan? You're gonna to have to sit down with your spouse and say, how do we make God at the center of our marriage this year? You're gonna to have to sit down maybe just with yourself or with some other single people and say, hey, let's do this together because we just, we need to support one another. How are we gonna bring God into the center of our singleness this year? It's gonna take intentionality and it's gonna take a plan. And so do it, do it. Sit down, 
Figure out what your plan is to bring God back into the center. Make a plan. Second chances are there for you. Maybe you need to join a community group this year. You thought you were going to last year and you didn't. Let's do it. You got it. You were gonna join that journaling group where you're gonna read the Bible on, early on Thursday mornings, but it's early, it's six in the morning, and can I do that? And you came three times, but you know, then you gave up. Listen, it's a new year. It's a new year. Come on, let's do it. Let's do it. We need each other. Let's do it together. I'll pray for us. Father, as we respond to you tonight, um, Lord, we just know that we can't do all of this on our own strength. We need you, Holy Spirit, to come and fill us because we fail time and time again. But if we can learn anything from this story of David, it's that you, you want to stop us sometimes, sober us up so that we can just look at what's ahead and say, I know that I didn't do it like I was supposed to, but Lord, I want to do it. I, I, want, I want you to be at the center and God will always be there with grace. That God, you are always there with us and that your voice is just crying out to us. He says, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't stop. Don't stop trying. I am with you. My grace is sufficient for you. I'm going to be there with you and for you. And so come on, let's do this together. Let's walk through this together. Let me into your life in this area because if you let my presence and my provision in to your life in this area, God says, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to walk with you. You're not going to be alone in it. So Lord, we just pray that we would have that heart tonight as we begin 2022 and as we begin it by coming to the table and receiving your body that was broken for us, coming to the table and receiving your, your blood that was poured out for us. And as we do, Lord, would you just search our hearts? What areas in our lives have we pushed God to the edges? Search our heart, God. How can we be intentional and make a plan to bring you back to the center? Search our hearts, God. Propel us forward. Be with us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much again for logging on and being here with us. We hope you enjoyed and we hope you have a great rest of your week.